Sometimes you go and you do things just to foster the relationship. You may not get what you want out of it. The other person may not get what they want out of it. You may have an objective that you don't get out of it, but the re- building the relationship and making the relationship stronger is an important objective in and of itself. All right. Well, here we are. We're going to do, what is this telling me? Oh, it's telling me the actual recording is in higher quality, which, uh, which I appreciate. So (laughs) off to a bad start. Um, so uh, we're going to do a little solo recording today. We, we had a, a guest lined up to do an interview this morning and let me just get these out of the way. Uh, we had a guest lined up to do an interview this morning, and unfortunately, I had a family emergency, so I'm still waiting to hear back. They let they let us know they wouldn't be here today, but I'm still waiting to hear back to make sure everybody's okay and all that kind of stuff. So, so we wish uh, we wish our guest uh, and their family the best, and uh, all of our well wishes, and and uh, hope to hear back soon that uh, everything is okay and everyone is uh, gonna be okay going forward. So, but we will we will bring you that interview. Uh, when we can, but we did, we had, uh, we had the whole place set up here at the house to do the interview today, uh, remotely over, over the software we use here, Riverside, um, they were going to dial in. Um, and, uh, because it's all set up, I figured, um, let's not, let's not let that go to waste. All the lights and the cameras and microphones and everything are, are all set up. So maybe, uh, maybe record a little bit of solo content here. And my thought today is, um, I will just talk a little bit about, my, about myself and my background. If you've been watching for a while, you've probably pieced some of that together through detective work from watching other interviews we've done or watching some of the educational content we do. But I thought this would be a good opportunity to kind of lay the story out and, uh, what I've been involved in in the past and how I got to where I am today and what uh why i have the views i have and uh what it is i'm trying to do and and you know what's what's shaped the journey to where we are today here and maybe a little bit about where we're going in the future with the company and that kind of thing and the content and all of that so uh if that sounds good stick around uh if it doesn't sound good um <laughs> that's great go go ahead and move to another video um but uh if you could tell us in the comments why that does or doesn't sound good to you and uh we because we'd love to get the feedback we want to make sure we're bringing you content that is interesting to you compelling to you and useful to you so um yeah go ahead good or bad leave something in the comments um if you're not if you're not getting the hint like comment and share even if it's a comment uh that we might not particularly like go ahead and comment anyway and we'll do our best to uh, address your feedback and bring you uh, more exciting interesting content in the future and that's one of the things we're we're working on i'm working on um and why you have not seen a ton of content uh especially short content and social media content coming out the last month or so it's summer here in Las Vegas, uh, I was doing a bunch of traveling, um, uh, was sick for a little while and just decided to throttle back a little bit and re-strategize, uh, the content. And we're, we're going to try to bring you some really good stuff, uh, both here, uh, on the YouTube and on the social media and on TikTok. We're trying to get into that in a little more entertaining and fun way to bring you content. So, uh, that's what's going on. Um, so let's let's dial it back. Let's go back to the beginning of uh growing up as a young kid in Connecticut uh in the 1980s if you can believe that. It seems like seems like so long ago, literally a lifetime ago, growing up as a a kid in the 1980s and uh starting when I was about 11 or 12 years old, all I wanted to do was be in the Air Force and Um, go be a fighter pilot in the air force and go be an astronaut and do those really kind of exciting things. And, uh, so that, that kind of led me down a path of studying engineering in college, um, kind of being a little bit of a goody two shoes, uh, in high school and college because, um, the air force at the time, and I think still has a lot of these policies of you have to have good grades to get into the air force. You have to have a clean record. Uh, you have to be in, in decent shape. It's a, it's a, 
right now we the military has a hard time recruiting in the country just because they kind of are still holding on to some of those rules that that maybe it's not quite so fair to hold teenagers to if they didn't know they wanted to be in the military before they tried to sign up so all that said it was a little bit of a goody two-shoes growing up and still a little bit of a goody two-shoes now um what is going on on my watch something something's happening uh not important so but yeah, that's led me down to, and I was very interested as a kid in science and math and engineering and all that kind of stuff anyway, although I was involved in some creative things like theater and technical theater and that kind of stuff growing up. So so actually, that's why I kind of enjoy all the technical side of the podcasting and the video here as well, doing the things we're doing today, because it kind of, it harkens back to a time uh, when I was younger and still learning about the world. So but yeah, I really focused on science and math and engineering in high school and went and studied engineering in college because I wanted to be an astronaut, wanted to be a fighter pilot, wanted to be an astronaut. Uh, so I went to college in Boston, Boston University for my undergrad. Um, I wanted to go to the Air Force Academy. I didn't get into the Air Force Academy. There's a whole process where you have to go get a nomination from your congressman, which I got, but in the final selection, didn't get selected to go to the Air Force Academy. So I did Air Force ROTC in college. Um, really great experience. Um, I think it was, I think I'd be a very different person if I had gone to the Air Force Academy and gone through that college environment, as opposed to going through a civilian college environment with a uh, kind of a military ROTC component to it. So definitely, definitely glad, you know, grateful that that's the, that's the path that I, uh, that I ended up ended up on and got my degree in aerospace engineering from Boston University, got commissioned into the Air Force in May of 1995. And less than two months later, I was in my brand new car that I bought upon graduation and driving from Connecticut, where my family lives, to Edwards Air Force Base in California, which is just down the road from us here in Las Vegas. So left uh left new england in july of 1995 and arrived in the middle of the desert in california a couple of days later and uh just got a real eye-opening view of how different the world is outside of new england and the northeast united states um both on that trip driving out and then living in california uh, and doing a lot of traveling for work during those four years I was stationed in California and uh, getting a real, real appreciation for how life is different in different parts of the country. Um, but I was, I was sold on desert life within like the first couple of days of being there because it was like 110 degrees. But also if you hung a towel up after you took a shower or got out of the pool, it was dry like within 15 minutes. So, so big fan of desert life and uh, not humidity like we have back in the Northeast and some of the other places I've lived. So what I was doing, uh, so I didn't get selected to be a fighter pilot. I didn't get selected to be any kind of pilot or operator uh, in the Air Force because I've always had some eyesight issues. And that kind of, that kind of precluded me from being a pilot or a navigator, or uh, I could do what's called at the time was called non-rated ops. But uh, there's a there's a long boring explanation about ROTC scholarships and career fields that was how things worked at the time in the 1990s and we won't go into that but uh suffice it to say uh, I was selected to go into the engineering career field in the Air Force on my first assignment at uh, Edwards Air Force Base California uh was not on the flight testing side of things and there was a lot of really cool stuff going on there at the time when I got to Edwards Air Force Base it was the beginnings of uh the B2 test programs the B1 test programs were going on uh the Air Force had retired SR71s a few years those are like the the really fast supersonic jets spy planes the Air Force had retired those about 5 or 6 years before and then for a very short period of time was bringing them back. So all the NASA pilots who were still flying SR-71s were training the new the new Air Force pilots who were going to fly SR-71s. There were F-16s, T-38s, F-15s, uh, you name it in the Air Force industry in the 1990s and what was coming along in the 2000s. And it was flying at Edwards Air Force Base all day, every day. So all you had to do was look up and there was cool stuff flying around Edwards Air Force Base. But I wasn't working on that side of the base. I was working on way across the dry lake bed at a place called the Rocket Site. It was uh, called Phillips Laboratory at the time, but it was the Rocket Propulsion Laboratory for the Air Force. So we had like a, 
uh, even living on base, it was like a 30 to 40 minute drive every day. You had to go off base and drive back on to another part of the very east side of the base up on the ridge there um, to go to go work at the rocket lab. And the rocket lab had all these great big test stands where they test the big rocket engines, the ones that actually launch things into space. And uh, like the Apollo moon rockets were tested there. Like there's a, there's a lot of really rich history at the rocket site at Edwards Air Force Base. It was, a, it, was, it was an amazing experience. I worked on what was called satellite propulsion, specifically electric propulsion, which was like instead of a chemical reaction to create thrust out of a thruster or a propulsion engine on an aircraft, you, you, we did things like electric arc jets or pulse plasma thrusters or Hall effect thrusters that used electricity and magnetism to try to accelerate things out. There. I'm, I'm getting into a very boring discussion of rocket propulsion here, but those are the kinds of things I worked on. And it really, really got me very technically minded. I was working with a bunch of PhD scientists and PhD candidate scientists, and they were really, really smart people. And they, they really taught me how to ask good questions, ask questions that were worth asking, and then follow down the path of answering those questions. And it also taught me when I saw how much work goes into getting a PhD that I never wanted to go get a PhD. So uh, we worked on, we had a, an experiment we actually put up on a satellite up in space that, uh, there back at the time. And that was, so that was kind of like my last six to eight months there um, with the exception of the last couple of weeks was working on that program where we were actually working with a satellite and doing propulsion on that satellite and doing operations on that satellite. So very exciting. And then, uh, so after California, I spent four years in California. I spent an extra year there to do that project, that space project on the satellite and moved back to Boston, which was not anything that had been in my plan, but got an opportunity to go work what are called special projects uh, at Hanscom Air Force Base, which is just outside of Boston. So moved back to Boston, worked on special projects, you know, secret, secret kind of thing, secret squirrel stuff. You've probably heard us use the term. And did that for three years, working kind of on um, what we called combat ID technologies, how we tell the good guys from the bad guys, uh, besides just looking at them, whether you're looking at an air-to-air -air target or an air-to-ground target. And that that three years back in Boston, I le actually lived in downtown Boston, just a few blocks from where I lived in college. And a lot of my college friends were still there. So we had a great time. And I was working on these really cool projects uh, out at the base. So I would drive out to the base every day and drive back kind of opposite the Boston traffic, which was really great. Also, uh, at the time, I wanted to go, again, still working on the dream of becoming an astronaut, even though my eyesight was not perfect. Worked out, did my master's degree in mechanical engineering at Northeastern University while I was stationed at Hanscom because I wanted to get into the test pilot school program for flight test engineers, the Air Force test pilot school, uh, in order to, um, that was kind of the path. If you were an engineer in the Air Force, not a pilot, uh, actually, even if you were a pilot, if you wanted to be an astronaut and you were in the Air Force, active duty in the Air Force, the test pilot school program was kind of the best path to try to do that. So um, got that master's degree, applied to that a bunch of times, never got into that program. But that's okay because that led me to my next assignment, which was here in Las Vegas, working on flight testing projects for just a whole variety of different things. But that really opened my mind into operational thinking, thinking about logistics, thinking about thinking about um, how things are going to get from A to B, how to, how to, in a very short time, get a project moving be, and be accountable. It really, like being a flight test uh, project officer really taught me a lot about accountability. And it really taught me a lot about um, authority and balancing those two concepts of you need to have authority. You need to have authority. If you're going to have accountability, you've got to have authority to make decisions. And if you're going to have authority to make decisions, there's got to be accountability, um, which is something you've, probably heard me talk about uh, either on this podcast or other podcasts, or if you ever looked at any of our uh, videos and that kind of stuff on the channel. So um, yeah, I had an amazing time. I was here in Las Vegas for five years, bought a house here, uh, made great friends, uh, just such such a great career. It was, so, it was so demanding a job. It was, I mean, I don't, I, I don't think there was a week that I worked that I didn't work less than 60 hours a week, uh, but it was so rewarding. And it's, if you've ever, if you've ever had one of those jobs where at the end of the day, you're dead tired 
like just dead tired, but you know, you did something important. You know, you made a difference somewhere because of what you did today. That was this job here in Las Vegas like that every day. And the next job I went to after that out in Colorado, that job was like that too, because based on my experience, I learned here in Vegas about moving projects forward and test doing flight testing and test projects and and uh you know really i really learned a lot about leadership in this job here in las vegas and being a leader and growing future leaders um which is you know so where i'm going with all this is like this is what shaped me to have the company i have today and why we're trying to teach leadership lessons from the military out to companies and try to bring these lessons here but yeah i learned a ton about leadership here i mean i learned a ton about leadership the whole time i was in the air force but really really about those accountability and authority aspects and getting people moving and motivated and just just really uh kind of a kind of a crash course in leadership for the five years I was here in, in Las Vegas and brought that to Colorado. That's one of the reasons they brought me into the job in Colorado was to be the director of operations for a, uh, it was a squadron at the time. I don't think they're organized that way anymore, but we would do what you call now rapid prototyping of capabilities, get them out into the field, get them tested. And then we would either operate them for a while or we would um, turn and then we would operate them from them for a while and then turn them over to an operational unit, train the operational unit, and then they would operate it um, going forward in the future. Again, these were these were things like someone in central command, like out in the Middle East, would call us and say, Hey, do you have a do you have a thing? Can you build us a thing that solves this problem? And normally we're like, Yeah, we can we can probably build you something that does that, or well, we can't really build you that because what you're asking for doesn't make sense. But what we can do is build something like this that will solve the same problem for you. So that was what we were doing, is we were coming, we were getting all we were getting these calls in from all around the world. Can you build us a thing? And we were saying, Yeah, we can build you a thing. And we would test it in our lab and then take it where it needed to go in the world to test it, and then somehow get it operationalized. Uh, so it could be used uh, to, you know, help help what we were doing out in places like Iraq and Afghanistan and over in uh, the Pacific and that kind of stuff. So uh, another really rewarding job, another, another, yeah, so, so dead tired at the end of every day, especially with all the travel that came along with that job. But just knowing everything you did was so important, was going to make a difference in somebody's life and kind of kind of the good guys winning kind of thing when we were doing that. And so uh, that that time, that job, because of what I was doing in my position there uh, in that squadron led to my first deployment, going to the Air Operations Center, the CENTCOM Air Operations Center in the Middle East. And we were actually taking one of those capabilities and bringing it online. And so I was part of the group that went in to do the command and control command and control of that capability. So letting that capability know when it's time to come online, when it's time to do their thing, when it's time to come offline in support of other missions that were going on in the region. So that was another really eye-opening experience for me because I didn't have any experience with like operational command and control in the military until I got there. And so it was really, it was really, really eye-opening to me. All of the things you need to think about from thinking about overall military strategy, and what and what we would call the operational level of war, which is a longer conversation that we won't get into here. But that's kind of what we were working on was the operational level of war, and then turning that into turning that into actionable instructions, so that squadrons and and units and their equipment can go and actually employ tactics to achieve an objective. So learned a ton about that while I was there during that deployment. They asked me to come move from the squadron when i got back from the deployment to colorado they asked me to go be a strategic planner for the same kinds of missions we were working on both in the squadron and at the operations center so i did that for two years and that's where i really started to get an appreciation for strategic thinking and that's where i really started to understand that strategic thinking like strategy is not just whatever i've done in the past that worked for me and just doing it like bigger and broader like strategic thinking comes in, you have to start asking yourself a lot of questions like, what don't I already know? What are, what are the things that, what, how, how, how might, like the way I've done things in the past not work here? What might work better? What are the things I can go learn about? 
Uh, how do I broaden my view? How do I understand more about the world? How do I understand more about adversaries? How do I understand more about allies and capabilities uh, to put together a bigger picture and look at different ways of trying to achieve the same thing and, and figure out which way might be the best way to achieve it. So I really started to get an appreciation for strategic thinking. And towards the end of that uh, tour doing that, they uh, I did another deployment to Iraq. I was what's called the case manager for the F-16 program. We were selling um, 36 F-16s to the Iraqi Air Force. Uh, we were going to build them a base to fly those F-16s out of, a whole bunch of logistical stuff. So we had some crazy amount of money, like $6 billion to work with on that project. <laughs> and so my job wasn't so much the worrying about the building of the aircraft. There were folks back in the States uh, who worried about like that side of things. My job was my job was being in Iraq and getting the Iraqi government ready and the Iraqi Air Force ready and making sure we were getting pilots over to get trained for them. Um, and making sure that they were doing the things they needed to do to build their base or to have their base ready when our contractors would come in and build the base for them and making sure that they were thinking about tactics, techniques, and procedures and how they were going to implement the F-16, imp implement using the F-16s in their air force and how they were going to use that with their other air defenses. And it was, uh, again, another eye-opening job about dealing with strategy. And also one of the really interesting things about that job is a lot of people don't know this even inside the military the foreign military sales program is actually not a department of defense program it's a department of state program like a diplomatic program that is run and managed by uniformed members of the department of defense so it's it's kind of this weird hybrid situation where you're doing like a you're actually kind of like a diplomat but you're still wearing a, a military uniform at least we were in iraq some you know in other parts of the world they aren't necessarily wearing a uniform when they do this this foreign military sales job but but yeah so i was doing that and that that broadened my appreciation for not just uh strategic thinking and thinking like now it instead of a squadron level or a or a group level or a wing level in the air force thinking like about an entire country and an entire air force but it also really started to, to broaden my appreciation of building relationships maintaining relationships and sometimes one of the lessons i learned from the state department people is ship you may not get what you want out of it. The other person may not get what they want out of it. You may have an objective that you don't get out of it, but the, building the relationship and making the relationship stronger is an important objective in and of itself. And so I learned that. And then the other lesson I really came away with from the State Department folks, and you may have heard me say this on other podcasts or in some of our other videos, um, sometimes you can't want it more than they do. And that, that was really true. Like I would find that as an air force officer, as Lieutenant Colonel in the air force, when I would see that like the Iraqis weren't necessarily doing, they weren't necessarily doing the pieces. They were kind of delaying doing some of the pieces that needed to get done to move things along. I would be really tempted to go, well, this is easy. I can just do this. And, but those words kind of always rang in my ears of you can't want it more than they do, because if you do it for them, and you're going to leave at some point and they haven't done it for themselves and learned how to continue doing it for themselves. They're, uh, they're not going to be able to do it for themselves in the future. And your, your uh, successor or somewhere down the line, you know, the Americans may not be there to do it for them anymore, not be able to do it for them anymore. So uh, just a ton, a ton of leadership lessons that I don't think I would have gotten if I hadn't taken that trip to Iraq, if I hadn't done, it was only six months. It felt like it went by in like a minute. It was so interesting and exciting. Uh, and it was at a relatively peaceful time. This was after our big drawdown in Iraq. This was 2012. So uh, we weren't, we weren't getting like rocket attacks every night, like previously. And all, everyone was kind of really well behaved in Iraq while we were there, uh, or at least while I was there. Um, so it was, it was not, not kind of what you might think about. And we, I certainly didn't have the experience that a lot of people had in Iraq of kind of constantly being under fire and under attack. Uh, it was, it was different. So I uh, learned a ton there just about relationships and developing people for the future so that they can be self-sufficient in the future and don't need us in the future. 
So just a, just a ton of leadership lessons that I don't think I would have gotten if I hadn't done that. And I wrapped up my career when I got back from Iraq, they sent me to Maxwell Air Force in, in, based in Alabama to be uh, an instructor in strategy, strategic thinking and military strategy at the online program for Air War College. There are two, two programs for, for, for military education in the Air Force is usually, usually an in-residence program, which is a little more prestigious, and then the online program, which is kind of for everybody else who doesn't get selected for the, for the uh, in-residence program. Still kind of the same objectives, a lot of the same material, but when you're doing it on your own in an online program, you're not getting the benefit of being in the room and having the conversations and developing the relationships and all that. But still, I think a very valuable program, and I didn't really understand the value of that education, that Air War College program, because I did the online program as a student before I went to Iraq. I finished it up before I went to Iraq. And when I, actually one of the reasons I ended up getting that, getting selected for that job, because I had already completed the program. Um, but like I, after I became an instructor, I felt like, oh, there's a lot of this program I missed things I didn't get. Now that I have to teach it to people, there are things that I wish someone had told me, this is what we want you to get out of, out of this. So um, another really valuable experience, a valuable leadership experience that taught me about leadership and developing future leaders is being really clear about what is it we want you to get out of something and making sure that's really clear, not doing the work for them, but making sure like we have conversations with people and say, Hey, at the end of the day, like, I really want you to be able to do this. You've got to go do the work, but I want you to do this and understand this when you're done. And if you don't understand this, let's have another conversation. So that wrapped up my career uh, in the Air Force. I retired in 2015. Um, and I, when I left Las Vegas in 2007, I really had no plans to come back here. And it wasn't until I started thinking about retirement and started saying, okay, I think I want to start a company. I think I want to bring some of this training that I've learned. All of these lessons I've learned the hard way in the Air Force, I'd really like to bring them out to... Um, it started out as individuals, like individual coaching kind of thing, and then kind of morphed. The company has grown over time to do more corporate training kind of workshops and work with groups and companies on developing a culture of leadership. But uh, that was the idea is I was going to bring this, start a company and bring this out, bring these lessons out to the world. And a lot of people do that, but I thought I could be good at it as well. And there was room for that. And I think there is. And um. Yeah, so I didn't really have a, I hadn't really thought about uh, moving back to Las Vegas, even though I still had the house here and it was renting it out. Didn't really start to think about that until like 2014 when I start when I knew I was going to retire and start this company and said, "Where am I going to go? Where am I going to live? Do I go to Boston? Back to Boston? Do I go to D.C.? Do I go back to Colorado? Do I go to California? Where do I where do I go to start this company?" and uh, the more I thought about it, the more I thought about how much I loved living in Las Vegas, uh, how much I didn't like uh, living in places with winter and lots of snow and ice. So it it just became, and I still had the house here and the mortgage was cheap and and cost of living is cheap here in Las Vegas, even now compared to compared to other parts of the country. So it, it, it made sense for a lot of practical reasons. Then just as it got closer and closer to moving back, I got more excited, more and more excited about it. So um, yeah, so all of that, all of that, everything I'd learned about leadership and working with other people and working with teams had been kind of percolating in my brain for the 20 year career of the air force. And then moved out to Las Vegas and turned that into a company and, and just got, got things going and, and got, got things started. And I found, I started to get involved in more and more things. One of the things I did when I got to Las Vegas was I enrolled in the MBA program in UNLV. I still had my GI Bill benefits and they weren't really going anywhere. And I don't have a spouse or kids that I could transfer those benefits to at the time or still. Um, so so I uh, enrolled in the MBA program because I wanted to learn what was being taught about leadership in business school. And fortunately for me, there's not a lot of um, real nuts and bolts leadership being taught in business school, or at least in our program at UNLV. I don't know if it's true everywhere else, but there was a lot of kind of HR compliance stuff. There was a lot of kind of 
you know, team building and understanding personalities and that kind of stuff. And I actually took a really good course on change management that was kind of focused on how you do like big things like mergers and acquisitions or create a culture change in your company, downsizing, that kind of stuff. And really took a lot away from the, I took a lot away from the, the leadership classes we did have, especially like the negotiation class. I got a new appreciation for negotiation and how important it was and realized how, 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 how important negotiation is in all of our lives and how I kind of learned basic negotiation skills the hard way in the Air Force and wish someone had t sat me down and taught me some real negotiating skills in the beginning of my career. So that's something I've factored into all the, I try to factor that into every course that I, I do for a client is working in some negotiation, some basic negotiation skills to give people something that I, I felt like I had to learn the hard way. That's kind of the whole idea is all the lessons I had to learn the hard way through 20 years of an Air Force career and now 10 in business. Like you don't have to learn it the hard way. I can, I can show you. So, but one of the things that I didn't expect there's been a lot I didn't expect retiring from the Air Force and a lot in the Air Force that I didn't expect and a lot coming out of the Air Force I didn't expect. I got part I got involved with a group called Rebel Venture Fund, which is a student-led angel investing fund. Um, so if you don't know what angel investing is, think Shark Tank, like you've ever seen, seen Shark Tank on TV, think that but just not on television and not, you know, not compressed into like a 7-minute segment on TV. So we would look at companies and we would look at deals and we would decide whether we were going to invest in them or not. Um, some donors had given donations to the university. Uh, and at the time they had about half a million dollars to invest in other companies. And so for two and a half years, uh, I was one of the associates at Rebel Venture Fund looking at investments, deciding what to invest in and uh, trying to trying to create, you know, help build companies and get a return on investment for, for the fund. And that was something I never thought, I, I mean, if you asked me when I was in the Air Force, you know, anything but the last three years I was in the Air Force, if you asked me if I ever thought I'd be an entrepreneur, I would have told you you were crazy. If you asked me if I ever thought I'd be involved in uh, venture capital and angel investing and startup communities, I would have told you you were crazy. Um, if you ever, if you, uh, if you told me I'd be involved in the veterans community and trying to help build veteran entrepreneurship, and entrepreneurship in general and help create a, a stronger veterans community in Las Vegas and around the country, I would have told you you were crazy. And those are all the things I'm doing now. That's that's kind of where we're headed in the conversation here is that's what it's all led to is I'm involved in the startup community here in Las Vegas, trying to help startup founders build, build businesses that are investable so they can go pitch investors and actually get that investment. I'm trying to help veteran entrepreneurs set their companies up for success, whether they're looking for investment and they want to scale that business or they just want a good small business to make money for themselves and their family and, and have a, have a, a life that they're that they're a little more in control of their own destiny on. And then just the veterans community in general here and, and trying to set, set veterans up for success in their private lives, their personal lives, their professional lives, um, whether it's workforce development and trying to, you know, if veterans are interested in getting into a technical job, I'm part of a charity here called actually nationwide, but I'm one of the chapter leads here in Las Vegas. It's a charity called vets in tech. And we're, our, our whole charter with Vets in Tech is to try to get veterans into tech careers, whether that's through education, whether that's through entrepreneurship, whether that's through workforce development and job placement. And we'll get into Vets in Tech another time, and maybe we'll get we'll get my good friend Dave Berlin on, and we'll we'll just uh, have a sit down talking about nothing but Vets in Tech and how great we think it is, and all the all the plans we have it for it here in the Valley to try to try to build up our tech workforce in the Valley and provide veterans with great tech jobs. So. That's that's what's going on. That's a that's a little bit of the journey and what I'm involved in now and how it kind of how the journey kind of shaped uh, the things I'm working on now, the things I'm passionate about now, and uh, you know who knows where it's going to go in the future. Uh, I want to do more of that's in tech. I want to grow my business. I want to help other people grow their businesses. Want to build our tech community here in Las Vegas. Uh, help veterans get into great jobs, uh, whether those are tech or otherwise. So. That's that's what's going on. That's the journey. Uh, I know it was a little bit rambling. I think we went we went way longer than I thought this would go. But uh, I hope I hope this was interesting. If it was, um, you know, please like, comment, and share it uh, to someone you might think is interesting, and leave a leave a comment. And if you have any questions, go ahead and 
and comment or slide into my DMs. We're on we're on all the social platforms. In fact, um, we're going to be experimenting with some different kinds of content. Where I think I said in the beginning, we're going to try to do a little more fun and entertaining stuff out on TikTok and Instagram. We'll see how all that goes. We're experimenting. But if you've got ideas for us, if you've got questions for us, if you have great ideas for a podcast guest or a topic, please let me know. Um, if you didn't like this, please also like, comment, and, and share it and tell us why you didn't like it or tell us what you would have thought was more interesting or tell us what you'd like to know that we didn't get to. So, uh, you know, if you're if you're not getting the hint, please please like, comment, and share on the on the video, uh, even if you even if you uh, didn't like it, and you have some feedback for us, whether positive or negative. So, always love to hear from you. Uh, I hope this uh, this gave you a little more insight into me, and you don't have to go do that detective work uh, to find out more about me. And looking forward to seeing you all next time. Onward and upward. <laughs>